Welcome. Thank you for coming to this session on what the research says. Um, <laughs> I'm really excited to dive into some of the findings uh, that I have summarized for you and done my best to summarize for you um, and see how you can think about them impacting your practice. So I recognize and celebrate that most of the people in this room are a good, good portion of them. Um, support learning in ways other than being in the instructor role. For this session, we're asking you to inhabit that role. So imagine your way into the classroom as instructor um, in order to process what we're thinking about this session. I'm hoping that will help you um, support instructors as you do, many of you, in your work. So to start us off, I'm very excited to introduce Manya Klemencic, who um, will be talking to us about her work researching education and talking to you about how you too can use your own classroom um, as a research lab to learn more about what, what the best practices might be for you. So Manya is, um, she researches, teaches, advises, and consults in the area of sociology and politics of higher education and international and comparative higher education. She's a lecturer in sociology here, um, and she teaches both in the sociology department and she's teaching this exciting gen ed course, Higher Education, Students, Institutions, and Controversies. And I actually wanna read you one line from the syllabus because it just shows how much she puts into practice what she studies. Um, so the centerpiece of the course is a collaborative capstone project that involves in individual research. The students are gonna be working in teams and collectively these teams constitute a Gen Ed 1039, that's the number of the course, community of practice connected through interest in higher education and committed to generating knowledge about and for improving higher education at Harvard and beyond. So that's, a, and you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that course. Um, and then Manya has, I mean, she's got many, many, many accomplishments. I am not going to summarize them all. Uh, among her many uh, co-editor and author roles, she is a co-editor of the forthcoming Routledge um, Handbook of, on Student-Centered Learning and Instruction in Higher Education. She'll also tell you a little bit about that. Um, she co-convenes seminar series at the Mahindra Center, uh, Humanity Center, and I also couldn't help mentioning that as a student, a college student, she served as Secretary General of the European Students Union, which was the student, provided student representation to the European Union on policy making around higher ed. So without further ado, here's Manya to give us a little bit of a kind of introduction to thinking about research on education. Thank you for the introduction. As Alan Garber said, this is probably my most favorite event here at Harvard because I am among my people. That is the people that really care about teaching and learning. And uh, every year I find being inspired hearing from different schools uh, across the bridge and, and the professional schools, each of which has done you know, huge innovations in teaching and learning. Uh, this year I'm part of the innovation that is happening uh, at uh, FAS, the college, with the Gen Ed program, and uh, I will draw a little bit from that. Uh, you have got the, already the leaflet uh, that the deal has put together in terms of the, what we know from research on the effectiveness of peer learning. It's in your folders, if not, there's extra copies down here. I want to kind of step a little bit further in, with the discussion and think about teachers as researchers in the context of peer learning. And now, I'm the instructor myself um, in a sociology department, and I know that most of uh, instructors at our schools are not going to go into the full-fledged educational research in, uh, of their teaching and learning practices. But still, I would like to speak about you know, variations that we can do as instructors uh, in trying to explore the effectiveness of the teaching that we have, in particular the effectiveness of the peer learning uh, uh, that, that we do. 
So in this uh, talk, I'm going to speak about teachers as researchers in a variety of the spectrum of possible research activities that we can do in classroom, and how those among you who are the supporting the instructors can kind of prompt them to go into the practice as teachers as researchers as well. And I'll speak briefly about the aims of the educational research into the p-learning and about the methods in, uh, that we can use. And when I'll be doing this, I will be uh, drawing from two case studies. One is my own Gen Ed 10029 Higher Education Students, Institutions, and Controversies. And the other one is the course in physics, uh, also here at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, that's a course uh, by uh, Logan McCarthy and Luis uh, de Serious, I am really uh, colleague as well at the physics department. And they have submitted the chapter in the aforementioned uh, handbook that I'm editing on student centered learning and instruction, where they have described moving from a traditional physics lecture into an active learning uh, uh, teaching of physics, where small group activities in the classroom were a very important part of it. Um, and you have heard earlier from Odile Vrede that my own Gen Ed course is very much, it's a research-based course. And in this course, what I try to do is, from my usual small seminars, which all of them are research-based, uh, where students do individual research projects in, in a class of 18 to 30, I try to scale up these research activities by creating collaborative group research projects. So, so I have thought about you know, peer, or which peer learning becomes a very important component. So when I was devising my course, and I would say that Logan and Luis have been thinking is the same thing, uh, we, had, we have several kind of learning outcomes that we have in mind when we think about group activities or peer learning within our courses. One and the most obvious is that you know, fosters problem solving, if possible, within the multidisciplinary teams. And gen ed multi uh, teams are necessarily multidisciplinary because they draw undergraduates from a variety of courses. Probably less so in the physics part, but uh, that, uh, I would say, it's even enhanced if you can create a multidisciplinary team. The other uh, expected learning outcome is raising student awareness and the capacity to negotiate and synthesize the differences in perspectives. And I can see this happening this very moment in my own class because students have come with the ideas of their possible research topics and their research interests. And we have done kind of a mind mapping on this. And then based on their mind maps, we have come up with the idea of several possible topics that they could research. And they, they had to uh, state preferences on these topics and on the state of preferences we have basically assigned them into research teams so they have not chosen and now at this very moment this week they had to negotiate what the research agenda of this, this each particular research team will be and this is where you have to begin you know thinking about different preferences different perspectives and then the third one and this is where we are moving in my course now is really increasing student understanding of the interdependence when it comes to knowledge creation and when it comes to learning as a social process and the and how and how you can generate collective knowledge uh, as being part of the group so this is uh, this is just something that we, I would say, both Logan and Luis in their physics class, and especially when in my class when I think about collaborative research projects, I had in mind uh, when I was creating the, the, the syllabus. So this is some of the concrete uh, methods that are involved under the big umbrella of the peer, peer learning in my course. So collaborative research design, students have to come together in order to agree how they will go about investigating a, a chosen topic and which methods they will do, what will be their data sources. Um, they have, they give peer, peer feedback on individual assignments. Students have to write also individual memos on the relevance of the topic that they have chosen and they have to write individual memos on the literature that is informing the topic. And on that, they have the individual peer feedback. Then we have the peer-to-peer -peer social science research methods learning. Among the undergraduates that I teach, some of them are uh, uh, concentrating in this social science division, have been through the methods training already. Others have never ever explored any kind of problem through the social science methods and come from different divisions. And this is where we kind of scaffold peer-to-peer -peer learning activities. Another one, collaborative field work. 
necessary part of a collaborative research project, people collect data collectively. And often, again, peer-to-peer learning, if you have done interviews already, uh, you take somebody with you who hasn't done interviews already. Before that, other person goes into the interviewing uh, uh, another group. Uh, collaborative writing, writing a paper together in the Google Doc, where each person is contributing parts and deciding on the roles who is going to go do, the, uh, do what. Reflection, an important part of re peer learning, and that means guided reflection, where we give them the prompt to think carefully about how they have been as researchers and how the collaboration within the research group has been going on. I'm adding in the brackets something that I usually do, not so much in this course, but I might even after hearing coach speaking this morning, uh, that is peer instruction. I might be using some of my athletes in the, in the, uh, to talk about this mental programming that the coach spoke uh, before and how to build confidence because I want them to build confidence in their ability to be independent researchers in this collective endeavor. So, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the other one bracket is, uh, which I am only just started, but I'll speak a little bit more in just in a minute, and that is I often get students to conduct meta course research project into our course group. So I, they act in a sense as a consultant, and they work into the, and they investigate our own course and the teaching and learning processes within the course. Uh, but not every course in every discipline lends itself, of course, to this kind of activity. Mine it does because it's on higher education, you can link it to it. Um, so there are different aims for instructors doing research while being teachers. And most, you know, typical one is the instructor basically wants to check the effectiveness of uh, his or her own teaching and uh, looks or in a specific uh, activity within their own teaching in order to improve her own practice, possibly to uh, derive evidence that can inform peers within the same department or in the, the school, and possibly, possibly that evidence can be turned into the public knowledge. This is what Logan and Luis have done. They have worked specifically to understand what's happening with the intervention of changing their physics course from the traditional into the more active learning, interactive lecture course. They have collected the evidence primarily to inform their colleagues, but now they are writing an article which is going to be published in a book that will inform practice, hopefully globally, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, and the type of the questions that we ask is, you know, typical is what works, but also what is, where we are trying to really understand the characteristics of the learning experience of the students in a specific context of a course. And then what could be, and this is a lot of the action research is oriented towards the questions how could we improve the practice of teaching and learning in our specific course or the departments? So I'm going to go to the next one, if it moves, and that is different methods or variations of education research. So let's assume for a moment not every instructor that you're dealing with will ever go into the full-fledged education research, uh, very rigorous, uh, elaborate into their teaching and learning practices. But there can be variations of that. And the variations that it was done is right here by Logan and Lewis. Um, what they said, you know, while our primary goal was not to conduct research into the effectiveness of active versus traditional learning, we knew that we have empirically minded that colleagues in our physics department who will want to see some data of whether our new uh, transformation actually works. And for that purposes, we have done some of the analysis of it. And what they have done, you know, they had some enabling conditions for this kind of uh, analysis. And one was they had a stable cohort, the previous, before the intervention, before the uh, changing the course and afterwards. Um, they also have a kind of a comprehensive exam, which they do not release to the students. So that they could actually repeat it before the intervention and afterwards. Um, uh, instead of you know conducting a randomized uh, experiment, uh, which would be uh, which would be much more fully fledged education research. And the, and the measures that they have taken were several. Exam scores is one and the obvious, comparing, especially when you have a stable uh, cohort. Student attitudes, of course you 
wonder how your intervention changes will be reflected in how students evaluate individual instructor and individual and the entire course experience. And furthermore, they also have what, what not all of the fields have, they have Colorado Learning Attitudes uh, kind of a survey. So they, they did the pre uh, and post uh, test survey on, to, to measure the, whether the attitudes of the students towards physics as a discipline have changed in some regard. And they have found that they have, and positively so. Um, and the, they also measured you know, how much time people spend on homework now and after, and things like that, part of the usual behavior studies. And, they, and what they have also found is that, uh, and this is not something that was part of research, but it was more how teachers uh, find the change activities. And they have usually, you know, what they describe it as more personally rewarding because it's more interactive with the students instead of just lecturing at people. Uh, and the impact it had on the colleagues, it, it's kind of ideas of active learning diffuse slowly within the department to other people. I'll be very quick about other proxy methods uh, for the research. So let's say you can't do all of that, and uh, because you don't have stable cohorts and things like that, uh, there's still things that you can do in terms of a kind of proxy of educational research uh, with using students as data sources. The usual thing that we use and inevitably use, of course, uh, student evaluations, the Q scores. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that people, there has been lots of discussion this, how perfect or imperfect, rather, uh, data source that is on the effectiveness of teaching. But it's still the data that we do consider in any case. But then you have smaller interventions. And those are much more of what inter as a way of a formative assessment and the midterm feedback, reaction cards on the specific activities that instructors can do in, in time of the class uh, ongoingly throughout the uh, semester. Reaction cards or minutes, papers, poll everywhere, Twitter where people are giving immediate life responses. Or if you are so inclined, and I was in my course, have a course a focus group discussions on the effectiveness of the practice. I have done it pre-course, but I will also do it with uh, the students uh, during the course, especially because, because I want to figure out whether this group collaborative work works for them and how can we make it better for them, because it's the first time I'm running around uh, this. And the final and the very final slide is uh, to talk about different methods of, educa of education research and here it's thinking about students not as our source of data, but as our partners in generating knowledge uh, about the effectiveness of teaching and practices. Uh, we kind of a sig a signaled it, but I want to carry it forward. A lot of my research is really about student agency and the impact that students can have on their education experience and, the, and their education environment. Um, it is also about how we can empower students to be more independent as learners, and in this case, and more autonomous as, as researchers. So, instructors, as part or in view of a you know, full fledged education research, can consider students as consultants. Consultants whom they regularly and in different forms ask uh, uh, for either gather and inter interpret data from other students. Uh, so for example, midterm evaluations. Midterm evaluations would be usually coming to me as instructor in my TX. Why not make it open and have a group of students as a focus group or a general discussion on it and have them consult on that, uh, on how they interpret what has been found and what we can do at this point to improve it for the rest of the course. And the other idea is really using students as co-researchers. Co-researchers uh, either by forming a a group, a research team that will be studying the, pro the course itself, what is happening in this course, or to have them as participatory action researcher, uh, researchers who are in, in view, view uh, collecting data from their fellow students on what's happening, how they understand the course. And you can then repeat this with different cohorts and, and do the change your course accordingly. So just you know, thinking about, in, to summarize, you can do fully fledged uh, research, education research into the effectiveness of teaching and learning and peer learning. And I'm hoping that some of the people in your departments take on this role, such as Logan um, and Luis in the physics and Eric Mazur in the physics. And we see what, uh, what Dustin is doing in politics. And I'm sure that you have people that go that way. 
and uh, they, these are our people, right? But not everyone will be doing our people in the sense of part of our communities, this communities of practice. But not everyone will be doing that. So there is, they, you as a support staff can encourage people to do a slightly kind of variations on the fully fledged educational research. One is when the course, as in the case of Logan and Louise, lends itself to this kind of a investigation because they have a stable cohorts and so on. Or as in my case, a new course, I can set it up now so that I will be able to compare and advance my practice in the next iteration. And, and thirdly, that you don't necessarily need to think, or that your instructors don't need to think about students as only source of data, but you can employ them as your consultants, educational consultants, or you can employ them as co-researchers generating knowledge on uh, peer learning and effectiveness of peer learning. Okay, thank you.